Hello and welcome to China Tonight. I'm Stan Grant. On the program, is China's economy really back on track? Not just table tennis, the quest to be the best in sport. And we visit China's underground music scene. But first today, what's making news among the people of China? Joining me is Yvonne Yong, and Yvonne, last week's birthday party for the CCP had quite an impact around the world and at home. Yes, massive celebrations, Stan. The July 1st anniversary of the birth of the CCP dominated the news last week. In particular, the speech President Xi Jinping delivered in Tiananmen Square to party faithful. The hashtags 100 years of CPC, 100 years of struggle, and tribute to the 100th anniversary of the founding of the party all trended. But it was this line. Anyone who would attempt to believe China will find themselves on a collision course. That attracted the most attention with 1.22 billion reads and hundreds of thousands joining in the discussion on Weibo. That hashtag came from Xi's speech. Which Reuters translated as... The Chinese people will never allow foreign forces to bully, oppress or enslave us. Anyone who dares try to do that will have their heads bashed, bloodied against the Great Wall of Steel forged by over 1.4 billion Chinese people. The New York Times version was even more graphic. Whoever nurses delusions of doing that will crack their heads and spill blood on the Great Wall of Steel, built from the flesh and blood of 1.4 billion Chinese people. While the official Chinese version is... We will never allow any foreign force to bully, enslave or subjugate us. Anyone who does will find themselves in a collision course with a great wall of steel forged by 1.4 billion Chinese people. Whichever translation, the sentiment was met with strong support online, even quoting a famous Chinese poet, Ai Qing. Meanwhile, Yvonne, life goes on for most people. Take this story, which caught the attention of millions this week. That's right, Stan, from Hingzhou City. This dad was concerned about his daughter being upskirted, but while the dad's attempts at performing normal activities while wearing a dress made many laugh, for others, it was a sad reminder. After heating things up last month, there are signs that leaders in Europe could be looking for a thaw in relations with China. Germany's Angela Merkel and France's Emmanuel Macron have held a video call with President Xi Jinping discussing climate action, trade and the pandemic. The two EU leaders also threw their support behind a joint investment deal with China, despite no widespread backing in Europe. President Xi said China aspires to joint development rather than competition. The call seems to have struck a more cordial tone than last month's G7 and NATO meetings, where leaders called out China's record on human rights and labelled it a security threat. Meanwhile, relations with China were top of the agenda at the Ninth World Peace Forum held in Beijing over the weekend. In a speech, former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd reiterated the need for China and the US to work together to avoid conflict. There are only two alternatives. Manage strategic competition with some rules of the road and some prospect of preserving the peace, or unmanage competition the loss of all strategic guardrails and the growing risk of crisis, conflict and war. And Yvonne, this really does raise that question, doesn't it, about wolf warrior diplomacy versus compromise. It's pretty clear, Stan, China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi continues to criticise the US, warning Washington, for example, not to connive with separatist forces for Taiwan's independence. And big news for another giant in the tech market as well this week, falling foul of the authorities. China's biggest ride-hailing app company, Didi Chuxing, says an order to remove its app from stores in China could hurt revenue. While it has more than 370 million active users already, the ban means new users can't register on the platform. The country's cyberspace regulator claims the company's been collecting users' personal data illegally and ordered it to make changes. In a statement, Didi said it will comply, aims to rectify any problems, improve its tech and protect users' privacy. The takedown order comes just days after the firm began trading on the New York Stock Exchange. Beijing has recently been clamping down on homegrown tech giants over anti-competitive behaviour and data security concerns. And we'll end the news today on another space milestone for China. Wow, that was a time, 
That was one of the two Taikonauts who made their first spacewalk outside China's new space station. They stepped out to start work on a 15-metre-long robotic arm, which will help them assemble the rest of the station. So another significant development, the spacewalk, is only the second by Chinese astronauts since 2008, Stan. Yeah, and many more ambitions in space as well to come, Yvonne. China is due to host the next Winter Olympic Games early in 2022 and has a big team set for Tokyo in just a few weeks. But is China a country you generally think of when it comes to the world's great sporting nations? There's a big push to excel, not only in the traditionally Eastern activities, but also take on some of the West's premier sports as well. Annie Louie takes a look. Despite the hands and Zhou Ji goes up for the jump. I only recently learnt that China is quite the sporty nation and that Taishan, where my family is from, is nicknamed the hometown of volleyball. Armed with nothing but the knowledge that volleyball is in our blood, my mum and I decided to put our skills to the test against some players from the State League. Alright, maybe volleyball isn't exactly in our DNA. I'm well aware that China is probably more known for brains than brawn. We have PE classes or just uh, sports classes. Um, but back then, um, teachers and schools, they, they just want the kids to focus more on their studies. Carl grew up in China and studied in Australia. He's now back in Guangzhou and trains in Latin dancing. So would you say there isn't much of a fitness culture yet in China? Yeah, I will, I will say yes, that's the, that's the case. Um, the best example would be uh, if we're, we're in Australia, we go to Coles, we go to Woolies, we go to 7-Elevens, we'll be able to find some protein products on the shelf. But here in China, you don't really get to see that. Chinese society is starting to embrace a fitter lifestyle, but the CCP has been harnessing the political power of sports for decades. In 1972, the US table tennis team famously visited China to open conversation between the countries in what became known as ping pong diplomacy. China has won all but two or three gold medals in the history of table tennis at the Olympics. They absolutely dominate it. Winning gold medals creates this image uh, that can be leveraged or, or evolves into this thing called soft power. They recognise that they're dominating in a lot of sports that aren't necessarily global sports. Uh, so in more recent time, they've been reaching out in terms of sports like uh, swimming, rowing and cycling and athletics. In fact, China was so determined to become a sporting powerhouse, they even played Cupid in the 70s, hooking up the country's tallest man with the tallest female basketball player to create the legend that is Yao Ming. And it's big money. Sporting leagues across the world want a piece of the pie, including the NBA, PGA and AFL, that are all trying to expand in China. China is no stranger to showcasing sport on the world stage. After hosting the Olympics in 2008, Beijing is now on track to be the first city to have hosted both the Summer and Winter Olympics. But now, groups alleging human rights abuses against minorities in China, including Uyghurs, Tibetans, residents of Hong Kong and more, are calling for a boycott of next year's Winter Olympics. Both President Xi Jinping and the International Olympics Committee agree that sports and politics shouldn't mix, but when you consider the values of the Olympics, it seems it's harder to separate. According to the Olympic Charter, the goal of the Games is to play sport at the service of the harmonious development of humankind, with a view to promoting a peaceful society concerned with the preservation of human dignity. But it seems the people of China aren't too bothered by the politics of it all. I love seeing um, athletes uh, after a game, like in basketball, in football, soccer, they embrace each other after the game, even though they they're different, so like they're from different countries, different cultures. I, I really love that side of the sportsmanship. It smiles all around. Hmm, maybe I should find a sport to take part in where everybody just gets along, like Chinese gentle dancing. It's often practiced in public spaces by people known affectionately as dancing aunties. So you're saying that anybody can do it, even me? Everybody can. 
Who knew that all this time I really could be good at sports? I just didn't know I was a dancing auntie at heart. Um, Annie's with me now. Gee, you enjoyed that. You looked as though you finally found your home there. That's that, that's your sport. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't even use the word sport very loosely there. I think I was sweating mostly because of nerves and not the workout. Well, of you were it, into but that was it. So you lovely. were into it anyway. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to stick to comedy. I think. <laughs> now the, the Tokyo Olympics are, are close. China's done really well. It's among the the top medal winning nations every single year, if, if not if not the top. What can we expect this time? Yeah, they're doing really well in the past. They've won medals, the most medals for things like gymnastics, diving and shooting. But they've also been known for table tennis, of course, which they won 28 medals in and also badminton. That's 18 gold medals in the past. So I think they'll be really strong in those areas. And as Jeff mentioned, Dr. Jeff Dixon, he says that they want to retain some of those uh, essential sports while also dominating in new areas that are more global sports. So things like athletics, cycling, and plenty more. It's done well, China, in swimming, but um, there's been a bit of a hiccup uh, in the lead up to these Olympics. Yes, so if you've been a fan of the Olympics in the past, you might, might remember Sun Yang, who had some famous beef with our Aussie uh, swimmer, that was Mac uh, Horton. So there's been some controversy again because of some doping punishment that he received where he was banned for eight years. It's been reduced now to four years. You won't see him at the uh, Tokyo Olympics. However, yeah, there's been some interesting news stories involving him allegedly smashing, uh, smashing vials of his own blood which uh, he believed that the person testing it wasn't legitimate, so he wanted to destroy any samples and not leave them uh, in the presence of any government officials. Yeah, a very complicated story. We're still sort of working through all the details of that. It's been great to see your stories um, on this series, Annie, and fantastic to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. You've been wonderful. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> COVID-19 has caused massive damage to the global economy, the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression of the 1930s. However, China's economy has bounced back fast after apparently avoiding the recession that hit so many other countries. But China's economic claims are often met with scepticism. David Chow takes a look. In times of uncertainty, people go to fortune tellers for direction and reassurance. But the Chinese government doesn't need any of that reassurance, certainly not on economic matters. In the late 1970s, Deng Xiaoping opened up China's economy to the West. Demand for its cheaper products made China the world's biggest exporter and the second largest economy within decades, and took many of its citizens from rags to riches. But is China's economic miracle all that it appears? A lot of the provinces in China uh, have been uh, overstating their, uh, their provincial GDP. And, and at the national level, oftentimes, uh, Beijing needs to uh, readjust them. One reason why local bureaucrats have been cooking the books is that their promotions are tied to how well the economy is performing. The Chinese Communist Party cannot rely on open and free elections for its legitimacy. What they rely on is delivering economic outcomes. That's the implicit contract the Chinese Communist Party has with the Chinese people. And the government sets ambitious targets every year, which it almost always meets, even if it means spending billions on ghost cities and roads to nowhere. Even China's premier had his doubts According to US diplomatic cables released by WikiLeaks, Li Keqiang said GDP figures are man-made and therefore unreliable. He said instead, you should look at electricity consumption, the volume of rail freight, and how much money is being lent out. Giving birth to the unofficial Li Keqiang Index. Unfortunately, it's better at tracking the manufacturing side of the economy rather than the booming services sector, which now makes up more than half the economy. Economists were sceptical again when China's economy appeared to recover quickly from the pandemic. Official figures suggest it avoided recession and that China had fully recovered by the end of last year. Domestic travel numbers uh, have recovered to pre-pandemic levels, but uh, the spending uh, travel spending is still only uh, about 75% uh, of the pre-pandemic level. So consumption 
uh, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the weakness right now in, in China. Like much of the world, debt could be a problem for the country's economic stability. And China has racked up $60 trillion worth of it, doling out cash to unprofitable state-owned companies since the global financial crisis and the COVID-19 downturn. Despite that, economists reckon that it's inevitable that China will overtake America as the world's biggest economy. Let's not forget China has four times the population of the United States. So frankly, something would be wrong if it didn't have um, a bigger economy than the United States. We don't get moving, they're gonna eat our lunch. And dessert, if the US doesn't up its game. Underground music in China is getting its moment in the sun. The wildly popular TV series, The Big Band, has given indie and punk rock bands new levels of celebrity. But in a country where speaking up to power can get you in serious trouble, how far removed are China's rockers from their anti-establishment roots? Jinghua Chan takes a look. Before the pandemic, the city of Wuhan was known for two things, ruogamian and live music. It's the birthplace of Chinese punk. In the 90s, bands like Shenming Zhibing stormed onto the scene with a DIY attitude and unmasked criticism of Chinese society. Wuhan is also home to bands, venues and record labels who produce everything from shoegaze to metal. But of course, Lockdown hit pause on that for a while. On the upside, not having to compete with big name international acts means more gigs for locals. These opportunities are coming at the perfect time for indie bands in China. TV shows like The Big Band have brought mainstream audiences to previously underground scenes. But growing popularity also comes with more official scrutiny. So censorship in China operates on scale rather than content. Um, and this was the lifeline that sustained the indie rock scene for like decades. Uh,微博呀,微信啊,你需要做宣发,然后你的售票,你需要收这些平台,然后呢,这些平台是受监管的。然后呢,场地呢,也是受监管的。就是所以说,就是说,现在基本上,演出都要去通过这个, 这个包批这个流程 As a result, you don't really hear the kind of unequivocal lyrics that Wuhan Punk used to be known for. People everywhere, including in China, tended to look at the indie rock scene as a form of truth telling. Like they, they, it was a form of social critique or it represented, you know, underheard voices. Border closures, internet censorship and market segmentation mean the indie music scene is now bigger than ever and also more insular. Platforms like YouTube and Spotify aren't available in mainland China, but there are plenty of Chinese apps competing for the domestic market. But there's maybe one crucial difference between the way the indie rock scene looks right now with how it used to look in China. Um, and I think part of that is this absence of any meaningful conversation with international bands or their contemporaries elsewhere. And I think it's been recast as a purely commercial endeavor. Most of them want to keep it real until times like these you don't hear peep. Critics say China's scene is divorced from context. For example, last year, Chinese-American artist Bohan Phoenix called out fellow rappers like Cheng Du's Hire Brothers for profiting off black culture without speaking up about anti-black racism. That said, Chinese artists do still find ways to address social issues obliquely. Artists everywhere get accused of selling out. That's not unique to China. What is unique is that underground music is suddenly in the spotlight. 
Right now, there's an explosion of talent, unprecedented interest from audiences and investors, and growing political pressure and scrutiny on artists. My next guest is no stranger to China's music scene, being a founding member of China's first heavy metal band, Tang Dynasty. Kaiser Kuo is now the editor-at-large of American-based China-focused media company, SubChina. He's also the host of the Chinese current affairs podcast, Sinica, and joins me now from North Carolina. Kaiser, I understand you've got a bit of a connection to Australia. You were once in an ACDC cover band in Beijing, of all places. Yeah, I was. It was called The Dirty Deeds, and there wasn't an Australian among us. But uh, yeah, grew up listening to Akka you know, in, in, in middle school. So uh, very fond of that stuff. It's not something, is it, that our minds immediately go to when we think about China, and that is a, a thriving rock scene. But it does exist. How much does it have in common, though, with the sort of subversive nature of rock that we find in the West? Yeah, I think the analogy is to the role that rock music played in the West can only take you so far. Rock was a, a, a was transculturated. It was a transplant. It, it's very much, you know, a foreign idiom, but, uh, and it, it grew differently in Chinese soil. Uh, that said, uh, I think that we, we should expect a music like rock to thrive in adversity, right? I mean, it, 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 uh, it needs to have something to push against, whether that's politically or, in, as is the case in China, often socially, just at the kind of conformity in Chinese society. Uh, that's great. I mean, and, you know, so it, it has some of that same spirit very much. It does go to that paradox, doesn't it? And something that you've written about here, it's a country that's very heavily weighted with its history, but capable of great renewal. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, that's something that I would see as sort of the central paradox. There are many people like to talk about lands of contradictions and things like that. But uh, for China, the one at the heart of it is, as you say, between the fact that China is at once, like no other country really, freighted by its history, just weighed down by history, burdened by history. But at the same time, China, and it's you know manifestly true, you just look at uh, the skylines of these Chinese cities and it looks like it's capable of instantaneous, you know, uh, transformation. It can turn on a dime, as they say. The way that I think you can think about it is that, look, uh, externally, the hardware, uh, they have made obvious, you know, gigantic advances in, but the software may, may not be there. The, the metaphor I keep going to is this movie from, I can't remember, the 1990s, I guess, with Tom Hanks in it. The movie Big. The Overgrown Child. Yeah, The Overgrown Child, right, exactly. So as you remember from that film, uh, Tom Hanks makes a wish, he's a kid, and he makes a wish to be an adult overnight, and yeah, sure enough, he wakes up in his bunk bed and scares the hell out of his mother, and he was this full-grown adult, and people sort of expect him to act like an adult, but of course, he still has the mentality of the 12 or 13-year-old that he was. Now, again, I do not mean to disparage shining this, this is just... Um, it's just a mismatch between uh, this in this single biological generation, how we've seen so much advancement uh, in the hardware, in the, you know, in, whether it's uh, the, the architecture of the cities or uh, the, the technology, but not, and I think this goes really far to explain why China, Chinese people can seem so, so very thin skinned, why they seem to react almost in a sort of national uh kind of coordinated spasm to uh, uh, perceived insults and things like that. China has been called, Kaiser, a, a fragile superpower. Um, and that is a bit of a, a paradox of the country, isn't it? Very strong, but also very sensitive. An authoritarian country on the verge of great political power. And now we enter into this, what many are saying is a new Cold War era and the potential for great misunderstanding. So understanding all of that, how should we navigate this period of history? Right. Uh, it is, and it is a precarious moment. There's no question about that. There are many flashpoints right now. Uh, there's a lot, there's a gigantic chasm of misunderstanding. I, I keep going back to this idea of cognitive empathy. Uh, I think that we really need to try to, to see what the world looks like, like out through Beijing's windows. We need to understand, you know, how our behaviors in the United States look, uh, and they don't always look benign. Sometimes they look downright threatening, and we need to understand that uh, it's not 
the simple emotional empathy that we're all capable of naturally, it requires us to actually lo- know something about the lived experience of Chinese people, know something about the history that forms their values, their beliefs, their habits of mind, and the other way around as well. I mean, I would urge uh, my Chinese interlocutors to do exactly the same because there's very little understanding of how Americans perceive the world in China as well. There may be an opportunity for greater convergence and, and greater understanding of each other, but is it not also a fact that there are red lines? There are areas where Western values and Chinese values or politics clash. We talk about issues such as human rights, what's happening in Xinjiang, what's happening in Hong Kong uh, as well. How should the West deal with those red lines when facing a country now as powerful as China? So that's exactly what I'm talking about um, when I'm talking about these these flashpoints in these areas uh, of, of misunderstanding. I think that, for example, uh, Beijing really doesn't understand uh, how heartfelt uh, the anguish is about the way that the Uyghurs have, have suffered in Xinjiang. I mean, I think that there's a tendency now to just believe in Beijing, to believe that that whole discourse was simply weaponized, that it, it's insincere, that it, it it represents not just you know abject hypocrisy, but that that it, it's been ginned up in a deliberate effort to discredit China, uh, Hong Kong as well. Uh, the, these are issues that I think the Chinese just have a, a great deal of difficulty understanding. Uh, the, the depth of, of, of sentiment here. Kaiser, as someone who has traversed both sides of this, Chinese, brought up in America, you've lived uh, in China as well. How do you see this hinge point of history, uh, particularly Xi Jinping's ambition when he talks about a China dream? What does that mean? Does that mean to usurp American power? Does that mean to live in a multipolar world? Or are we talking about China dominating the world, a Chinese hegemony. What does this look like from a Chinese perspective? Yeah, I I think of the three options that you laid out, it's certainly the one that that gets best at it is uh, China living in a multipolar world uh, with a sort of um, regional hegemony with, you know, dominance, sort of the top of the pecking order in its neighborhood in East Asia, within the first island chain, as they like to say, Um, you know, to re- attain its historical role, what it sees as its historical role as sort of top dog regionally. But, um, you know, I think that, that that a lot of people have exaggerated this and have, have said that, you know, China seeks to truly supplant the U.S. as a new global hegemon. I think, you know, nobody is more aware of the, the limitations and, you know, the lack of appetite for this than the Chinese themselves. There's no, no, no such desire. Uh, and yeah, I think that um, within that that realm, they want their their power to be essentially unchallenged. Yeah, Kaiser Guo, thanks again for your time. Much appreciated. My pleasure entirely. And that's all we have on this series of China Tonight. You can watch any of the episodes again on iView, and we hope that you've enjoyed the show. For more on China, you can download China if you're listening on the ABC Listen app or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Stan Grant. Have a great night.